For the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile. And the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time. There's Granger, Offering professional-grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger For the ones who get it done. My goodness, the New York Times wants you to know that wages are up, wages are up, wages are up 5.5% thanks to Joe Biden. Wages are up. Did I mean, did I tell you wages are up? Did y'all know wages are up? The New York Times wants you to know wages are up 5.5%. Uh, if you read the story, you will be hard pressed to note inflation is up 8.5%, meaning that actually there's been a decline in, in buying power of 3% for all those wage increases. Yeah, that's why Joe Biden is not doing well. Welcome. It's Eric Erickson here. The phone number is 877-973-7425. I, 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 I want a word, if you will. I want to just talk to you, at you, with you. I'll take your phone calls. Uh, we, we get an uh, increasing number of people who sometimes call and say, why am I your host? not talking about this thing everybody else is talking about. Why, why am I not talking about this thing you want me to talk about? Why am I not talking about this, that, or the other? Uh, and I want to talk about that. Why do I talk about some things and not other things? Why do I talk about some things you talk about and talk about them in different ways? Why do I sometimes focus so much on major media outlets and not fringe outlets from the right? Or small outlets that you like? The easy answer is it's my show. But it's actually far more complex than that. And, and I don't mind pulling back the curtain because I've gotten so many comments from so many people lately on why don't I? There are a number of reasons why. And, you know, I do a daily email and truth be told, Philip actually puts it together for me. I outline everything I want to talk about on the show. I put all the links in, and he takes all those links and then some and adds them to a show notes email. It comes out right as the show starts with the link to the live stream. And it kind of is your daily briefing of all of the no news, or not all the no's, all the news you need every day to keep yourself as informed as possible. You can subscribe to it by texting DATA to 33777. And you get that every day. In addition to all the other stuff we put out on Substack, that one, but more and more of you are raving about it. I'm happy to. Um, and I got to get better about putting the podcast out for paid subscribers as well without all the ads and stuff in it. I'm probably going to have to delegate that one. But nonetheless, we do that. And so you can see where I get all my stuff from. I get it from uh, conservative sites and liberal sites, mainstream media sites, uh, left-wing opinion sites, right-wing opinion sites. I, I kind of scour the web. There are radio companies in America that will produce a package every day and send them out. I could subscribe to one. I could pay for it if I wanted. And it, it does all the show prep for you and you can build your story around it. I like to do my own. I subscribe to a vast array of newspapers and magazines and websites. I follow along with what people are tweeting about in Twitter. And I find that I gravitate towards the major media outlets for one particular reason. I don't do talk radio. Ah, that's gonna come as a surprise to all of you. I don't do talk radio. No, no, I, I don't, there's a difference. There is talk radio and there is news talk radio. And I do news talk because I like the news. I am a news junkie. And I think if there's breaking news, I should be able to cover the breaking news. If I'm in the middle of a thread, if you're, if I'm in the middle of a topic and you're a regular news listener here, you're a regular listener to this show. If I'm in the middle of a topic and there is breaking news, I am going to talk about the breaking news. Now, no disrespect intended for those of you who listen on delay or in podcasts, but 
I believe that I've got an obligation to do something that you can't get out of just a regular old podcast. And that is if there is a immediate breaking news to get and acquire as much information as possible about that subject as immediately as possible and be able with my background, knowledge, understanding, and sources to be able to relate that information to you in a way for you to understand, to understand what's going on in the world immediately around you and share that information with your friends so that you sound smarter than all of them. My job is to keep you entertained and company with you wherever you are. And part of what I feel is my way of keeping you uh, entertained and informed is to make you the smartest person in your circle of friends so that they are always relying on you for information. And that is why I rely on the major media outlets, because the major, major media outlets are where all of the sites that you read rely on their news. When you read an outlet that is a conservative site, that conservative site has inevitably gotten their news story from a major media outlet and then has parsed it and synthesized it in a way for conservatives. I would rather do that myself. One of the things I don't like to do is to listen to other talk radio shows. I have friends who send me their monologues from radio. I have friends who send me their podcasts. I don't listen to them. And it's no disrespect to them. I learned this from Rush. Rush Limbaugh never listened to his guest hosts. I don't either. And I love them. I, I, I love them all. They're all great people. And I'm thankful that they will sit in for me. But I don't want their thinking influence in my thinking. Because I want to be able to arrive at the news fresh and synthesize it. But more importantly, I try to do something that not a lot of people do, and that's to analyze. You all know my, my thinking. You all know where I stand on the issues. You know my faith. You know my worldview. You know my opinions. Uh, maybe you don't know my opinions. You know, when, when we research the show, the thing that comes back all the time is, is I'm completely unpredictable, and that's fair. I realize I am. I, I It's just my personality. When everybody's going one way, I tend to go the other way. I tend not to follow the herd. Sometimes it gets me in trouble. Most of the time, I think it saves me from getting into trouble. But the thing that I really like to do is to analyze the information. And that's why I like to read if there's a major story out there. Take the economy. Today, for the economy, I read stories from the Wall Street Journal, the Epoch Times, the Christian Science Monitor, the New York Times, Bloomberg News, the Wall Street Journal, CNBC, CNN Business, and Fox Business. And my opening monologue was based on a lot of audio from a lot of these sources, from things pushed out by the, the Republican National Committee's research feed on Twitter, and building that so that you're as informed as I can possibly make you informed about the economy. Or take the stories about uh, Elon Musk and, and Tucker Carlson, all of which are in the New York Times. I, it, it was my specific intention to be able to cover those stories to show you this is what the national media is obsessed with as opposed to the economy. They're obsessed with dragging these people. They're obsessed with the character assassination, and here's why. And you need to know about it. You need to know about it because it goes beyond the New York Times now. Major media outlets, some of which are right of center, are covering those stories, and they're not necessarily giving you the angle I'm giving you on the biases and why those biases exist. They're certainly, if they're on the right, defending Tucker Carlson, but they're not pointing out the major reason. It really has nothing to do with Tucker Carlson. It has to do with his audience, and it has to do with the radioactive nature of 2022 and trying to find something to run on since Donald Trump really isn't on the ballot. Neither is Tucker Carlson, but you can see Tucker Carlson on the news every night. Now, some people email. This is my main reason for spending a bit of time with you on this. They, they email and say, why aren't you talking about this thing I care about greatly? Probably I'm not talking about it because everybody else in conservative radio is talking about it. So you can hear like 20,000 different opinions and those different opinions are all going to be identical. One of the worst things to happen to conservatism and progressivism both is the group think and the bubble that sets in. The left is on the verge of losing right now because they're in a bubble. They're in an echo chamber. Nothing is allowed to penetrate it. And don't think we can't get in one either. Because I've seen them happen. Uh, Neil Bortz, dear friend of mine, I was hired uh, by WSB Radio in Atlanta actually to replace Neil Bortz. They knew he would be heading towards retirement. 
They were trying to keep him. He he wanted to retire. And ultimately, Herman Cain came back after his presidential run, and they put him in the spot. And I got evening drive time for about a decade. But uh, Borch used to say he was the high priest of the Church of the Painful Truth. And I always liked that. I'm not going to steal it from him, but I like that, that sometimes there are painful truths that our side doesn't like to acknowledge either. And oftentimes uh, we have on our side hucksters, frauds and con men, charlatans and felons who we listen to, who tell us exactly what we already believe and uh, nothing can penetrate our bubble. No information is allowed to come in contrary to what our own ministries of truth provide. And I think that's a terrible way to do radio. I think it's a terrible way to do news. And you can disagree with me, but I am far more interested in what the actual major headlines of the day are. When I get up and I start planning the show every single day, my first question is, what do you, my audience, need to know is the most important thing of the day? And then my job is not to tell you what to think about it, but to give you every possible bit of information so that you can think for yourself. And I got to tell you, I occasionally encounter people, and I'm thinking, my gosh, maybe I need to start telling them what to think instead of letting them think for themselves because these people are nuts. Y'all, y'all there's some, there's some crazy out there. We all know it, but I just, I just, I don't want to be the guy who gives you the red meat. I don't want to be the guy who says, oh, there's chum in the water. I just let, let's all pounce on this story and let's all hate the Democrats together and let's all ridicule the Democrats together and, and let's trash them and let's make ourselves feel morally superior because it's easy to do. That's cheap talk radio. It's like a sugar high and everybody does it. And I would far prefer to tell you, I realize everyone's over here at Nina Jankowski and her ministry of truth. And I talk about it a little bit too, but the really big big story today is how bad the economy is and how the media is giving you part of the information to make it sound good, like pay raises, pay is going up 5.5%, but ignoring to put it in the proper context, but inflation is 8.5%, therefore you've actually got a 3% decline in take-home pay. That's that. I, I just view that as my job. Try to keep you entertained, try to keep you engaged, and make you so much smarter than everybody else out there. And that's why you keep coming back. And we're not always going to agree. Like my worldview, you know, the number one thing people say about me is, is you, you never know what I'm going to say. And it's, I don't even know what I'm going to say. Honest to God. I, I mean, my mouth just opens and God knows what comes out. Um, uh, no disrespect for people who think I'm taking the Lord's name in vain. I'm not. The, the good Lord has guides my tongue half the time, saving me from myself. Usually uh, there was that one time recently, <laughs> but, but I just, don't want to be the guy who tells you what you already think. And I don't want to be the guy who lives in the bubble, unaware of what's going on outside the bubble. And I think the more we make sure that our bubble is penetrated by the real world and what people think and understand that sometimes people vehemently disagree with us. It's like when I was a political consultant, I was running campaigns. I, I've said this so many times. I would always, always tell my candidates, whether they were running for Congress or whether they were running for like a city council seat, always know when you're in the minority, even when you think you're right. And oftentimes, uh, because our echo chamber exists too, and the right is fierce space, we, we, space we, we sometimes think that, that we're in the majority. Everybody agrees with us. And actually, no, that's not true. And we need to be able to understand that because otherwise we're going to be caught off guard. I, 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 look, I firmly believe the election wasn't stolen in 2020, and I know many of you disagree with me on this. But I think if we were less inside a bubble, it wouldn't have surprised as many people as it did that Trump wasn't going to win. Now, I didn't think he was going to win in 2016. I was in my own little bubble, and I was wrong. And in 2020, a lot of people said, well, you were wrong in 2016. Yeah, but, you know, I, I, I do know I'm self-aware enough. I know how to correct. I know how to rethink things. I, I realize when I get something wrong, I should process data differently. And there were a lot of people who were in their own bubble and they were completely caught off guard. I, I could see what was happening. And towards the end, it became really obvious, actually. I, I had thought, you know, all of the Democrats and all the Republicans that I'm talking to say this massive blue wave is coming. And by the end, it was very obvious there was going to be no blue wave because the left had gone nuts. 
And, and the, a lot of people say, well, this is why he must have lost because all these Democrats lost. How could he have lost? Well, the the, the, the corrective here, the, the analysis here is that the voters turned on the people they thought were the biblical donkeys, him and then all of them. But if you're in your bubble and you stay in your bubble, I think the truth sets you free. That's why I do what I do. And that's why I rely so much on mainstream media outlets, because so often the important story in the media is not what the mainstream media outlets are telling us. It's what they're leaving out of the story and to compile them and cross-reference them and read them. So then I can point these things out to you because your friend's going to come to you and say, did you see the story in the newspaper? And you'll be able to say to them, yes. And here, let me point out what they left out of the story. And then your friend will realize you've got lots of wisdom and maybe they should start listening to you instead of listening to the talking heads on CNN and MSNBC. Welcome back. It's Eric Erickson. The phone number 877-973-7425 if you want to be on the program. I was talking about the bubble. that I I, I don't want to live in the bubble. Um, the, the bubble makes you uh, caught off guard when things happen. There is polling out. Only one third of Americans believe Mississippi's uh, law at stake in the Dobbs case, the 15 week abortion ban, goes too far. Only one third of Americans believe a 15 week abortion ban goes too far. 10% believe that the Supreme Court should set abortion law. Only 10% believe the court should set abortion law. In other words, Sam Alito's draft opinion is squarely within the majority. And Roe's holdings are only supported by a tiny minority of people. The Democrats are in a really big bubble about abortion. Their donors support abortion rights. An organization called Rise Up for Abortion Rights has organized a week of action beginning May 8th on Mother's Day. That's right. On Mother's Day, they're going to protest for the right to kill kids. Yeah, so reaffirming, reassuring too, isn't it? Action outside of churches. Uh, churches across America are putting out warnings that they may see protesters. Catholic churches in particular are being targeted around the United States this weekend for protest. Uh, several Catholic churches in Washington, D.C. have been vandalized because they blame the Catholic bent of the members of the Supreme Court. Uh, Justice Gorsuch is an Episcopalian. I will not say anything. I will not say anything. The rest are Catholic. Uh, <laughs> um, and so they're targeting Catholic churches in particular. This isn't going to go over well with people. This is part of the problem here is, you know, your average reporter in Washington and New York is to the left of Nancy Pelosi. They're close. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is on the far left spectrum for the Democratic Party, further left than Nancy Pelosi. And a lot of the younger, the 20 and 30 something reporters are there as well. They are far to the left of where American public opinion is on abortion. Now, I am mindful that a lot of Americans, including those who call themselves pro-life, are to the left of me. They're okay with, with, with early, early abortions. Um, as opposed to banning it altogether. I'm mindful of that. And I, I dare say I'm a little nervous that uh, some of these efforts we're already starting to see spring to life of round up the women who get abortions and throw them in jail, treat them as murderers. That's going to become our defund the police, that we will think we're on the side of righteousness and the American uh, public will think we're back crap crazy and start voting Democrat again because we've overplayed our hand. I, I'm afraid it will come to that eventually. Just wait, see, maybe I'm wrong. I don't think I am. But the Democrats right now, they're the ones overplaying their hand on this. If you're going to start disrupting church services and vandalizing churches and attacking Christians and, and trying to scale the fence at the Supreme Court after uh, for a year trying to tell us January 6th was the worst thing ever, good luck with that, folks. You're going to see a massive, massive red wave. Uh, building in November as the Democrats overplay their hands. The media has for so long told them all of America is pro-abortion. They believe it. And it turns out the media is pro-abortion. The Americans, not so much. And that discrepancy is going to matter greatly for the politics ahead on this issue. The New York Times, or no, wait, wait, I'm sorry. It's the Atlanta Journal-Constitution is reporting George Soros is putting a million dollars into getting Stacey Abrams elected in Georgia, or is it reelected? I'm, I'm, 
I'm not sure which. A million dollars thrown down the drain for Stacey Abrams. Uh, you know, one of the downsides of that race down in Georgia is that um, – uh, the uh, the Republican primary Brian Kemp has had to spend a lot of money there, and Abrams is now out raising him at the at the general election level, thanks to David Perdue. And I very much doubt the way this is going that um, David Perdue will step up and try to help Kemp raise back the money he's had to spend. It's going to be a mess. Also, just randomly, if you are in Georgia, Bruce Thompson is who you want to vote for Labor Commissioner. Bruce Thompson. A uh, good Christian dude, great guy. I, I got to tell you all a story. Um, so you know, I, I was I was a lawyer in Macon, Georgia, for a number of years. There's this genuinely, just I, I would say, crazy person. Um, just a, a, a deeply unpleasant person uh, who was a lawyer here in town. And in fact, um, my last case. So this, I, I grew up in Dubai. I think you all know that. Did not grow up in this country. And I was very mindful when I moved back to the United States when I was 15 years old uh, that this country did have race issues. And I tried to get educated. And I tried to understand. And when I became a lawyer... I had to do indigent criminal defense. Y'all, I, I, I've told this story before. If you're new to the program, if you're new to the show, I know we got a lot of new listeners. This, this is uh, y'all who have been with me for a while. You've heard this. Forgive me. Uh, my very first case as an indigent criminal defense attorney was this man who said a, a man had put uh, crack cocaine under the driver's seat of his car, and and that man looked like me. So I went to court, and I was like, Your Honor, I'm for the mean Judge Christian, who's just the nicest person, but she was she was tough. And I said, Your Honor, can I approach? I, I got to get my client a psych evaluation. And, and I come forward. She says, what's the problem? I said, well, he says a man put crack cocaine under the driver's seat of his car. And he says the man looks like me. And he's very insistent. The man looks like me. And she shoes me to the side. She says, sir, stand up. She raises her hand. He stands up. She says, sir, is it a man or the man planted a cocaine under your car? She says, the man. <laughs> she says, Mr. Erickson, your client's a racist, not crazy. Thinks the white man did it. It's an eye-opening experience for me. And anyway, so there's this lawyer. Um, and my very last case, oh, it, it, civil case, was a property dispute in Taylor County, Georgia. This is 2005, and it is probate court. And this probate case had been going on since, are you ready for it? 1905. 100 years this case had gone on. Probate cases aren't supposed to last more than a year or two. Why? Well, because it was a slave. It was a slave from the Civil War who gained his freedom, acquired property, and in the rural south of Georgia in the turn of the 20th century, his family was deeply, deeply afraid that if the case came out of probate, that white people would steal the land. And they had every reason to believe that was so. So they kept the case tied up in court for a hundred years. And it just probate judges, it come and go. And they just kind of left it in probate. And the family settled on the land and everybody had a little share of it. Well, by 2005, one of the couples they wanted, it amounted to basically a quarter acre of land on which they wanted to build a house. And they couldn't build that. None of them could ever build it. They hunted on it. They fished on it. They farmed it. Couldn't build a house on it because uh, the title wasn't in your name. It was just collective community property, if you will, for this family. And I got in there and this lawyer knew nothing about I felt so bad for the other side. First of all, her, her position was that it should stay in probate court. This is 100 years going. It should stay in probate court. She's just, she had no idea what she was doing. I was so appalled. I, I felt bad for the other side. It was my last case. I did probate law. Uh, I was with a, my, my buddy, Neil. It was his case, but I kind of knew the probate stuff. Uh, and it was just, it was, I, it, this couple deserved their property and, and we were very successful. And that lawyer on the other side was just, uh, I just not a good lawyer at all. I only tell you the story because I got my absentee ballot and I'm making my way through it. Good Lord. This woman is running for the court of appeals in Georgia or no, it's the Supreme court. She wants to be on the Supreme court of Georgia. So there's a, there's a lady, um, uh, Vera Colvin. She is a, a Supreme, is it Vera, is Verta, Verta. 
Colvin. Um, y'all would all, everywhere in America, will know who this woman is, Verda Colvin. She's on the Georgia Supreme Court. She was appointed by Brian Kemp. She's the first African-American female appointed to the Georgia Supreme Court uh, by a Republican governor. And uh, several years ago, it went viral. Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, uh, all, all the major news outlets, she was lecturing a young man uh, who had killed someone. It was an accidental shooting, but she was essentially, I mean, it was a young black guy. She's a, a, a black female judge, and she was just giving him to business. And it went, vi- it was all over national news networks, this this lecture she gave the kid that he was going to go to jail uh, because he was an irresponsible idiot playing with his gun. He knew better. He shouldn't have done it. And she is tired of seeing young black men going to jail for killing other young black men in gun culture. Uh, and she just, uh, it, w- it was an incredible, incredible speech. And she is, anyone who knows this woman, and I do know this woman, is just one of the nicest, greatest, smartest people you could possibly have. She's kind of the judge you want to go before. Now she's on the Supreme Court. Verda Colvin in Georgia. And this this woman who, the Veronica Brinson lady, has decided she wants to run against her. This woman, I've always thought she's kind of crazy. I, I can't believe this woman thinks that she could be on the Georgia Supreme Court, let alone that she should be challenged to this lady. And, and so they're, I'm sure there's some sort of history there. In fact, I believe Judge Colvin um, uh, got on to this lawyer more times than what I'm just saying. I, I realize none of you care about this drama, but I'm fascinated by the soap opera nature that this this crazy lady thinks that she should be on the Georgia Supreme Court. Um, I got my absentee ballot, and I, I haven't filled it all out. Like, I, I voted for Bruce Thompson, this uh, labor commissioner, because he's the best guy there is. Um, and I, I haven't made up my mind on the Senate. I've got Latham Sadler and Gary Black going to be on the show. Uh, I voted for Brian Kemp, um, and and I just, this one, I got to that, and I was like, oh, my gosh, uh, good Lord. And then there were all these questions. Each party, I don't know how it is in every state, but in Georgia, each party can ask questions on their primary ballot, and they were all absurd questions on, on the primary ballot. I just, what a waste of time. All right, we got to go to phone calls. I, I, I said enough about crazy people running for office. Trevor, I'm going to go to you next. Welcome. Yes, how are you? I wanted to comment on what you said earlier about, you know, the, you know, left and the right, you know, about them policing themselves. I heard that you mentioned about the case in Louisiana, which is a perfect example of the right needing to, you know, pull back, you know, and not go, you know, not go too far. You know, they're planning on on actually passed a bill in the Louisiana House that said that would criminalize the actual, you know, person getting the abortion, the woman getting the abortion. You know, um, they want to make it so that they want to criminalize the person as early as fertilization. They're claiming that, you know, that person's, you know, that that's, you know, that's personhood. If they did that, then they would criminalize every woman that's ever had had a miscarriage, which is 10 to 20 percent of most of most um, pregnancies that that do occur. Well, I, I, because they would make I'm, I'm not not to interrupt not to interrupt your your your, your statement, but um, that would make it that that woman then would have to prove that she that it, her miscarriage happened naturally and wasn't medically induced. Well, when you actually read the text of the legislation, even the one in Louisiana, um, they don't mm-hmm. actually do that. Um, the, the the presumption is that a miscarriage uh, is natural. Uh, the presumption uh, is that a, a miscarriage will be presumed to be natural unless there's evidence to the contrary. That's the actual text of all. You know, so what all of this comes from is there's a law. It's made it out of committee in Louisiana that would essentially criminalize abortion and charge women who have abortion with homicide. The, the issue here, however, is that you have to actually read the law. Now, I, I got to tell you, uh, I think that life begins at conception. It's not actually a religious view in my part, although it's it, religion certainly affirms it. It's science. The cells begin their division and replication uh, at conception. 
And as a result of that, life certainly begins at conception. The DNA becomes this new thing. Uh, so it is life. It may not be viable life, but it's life. And so you are killing a human being at a stage of life. But all of these laws, and this is what the left likes to say, ectopic pregnancies, miscarriages, and the like would all be criminalized. And that's not true. And you need to understand, it is a lot of garbage. It, it, it simply flat out is not true. Uh, because all you have to do is is know that when you put a series of letters together, all of which include vowels, they become words unless it's gibberish. And these words are words that you yourself can learn and have definitions that you can look up in the dictionary where you read other words to find out the definition of that word. And then you go read what those words are in this thing called the legislation and you put those words together in a sentence and those sentences form paragraphs and you get the context of it. And lo and behold, what you find out is that this is all a bunch of BS. That uh, miscarriages are exempted and miscarriages are presumed to be natural unless there's evidence otherwise. And so all of these nightmare fear scenarios of, oh my gosh, we're going to be rounding up women because they had miscarriages and throwing them in jail is crazy talk, conspiracy theorists. But I, again, I, I really do believe that if we go down this road as a, as pro-lifers and start rounding up the women who've had abortions and throwing them in jail, that this will be for us what defund the police has been for the left. That we will, in our righteousness, pride ourselves and pat ourselves on the back for doing justice. And the voters of America will say, these are insane people, time to vote Democrat. And we will set ourselves back very, very, very far. I just think you got to be careful. You, you overplay both sides, overplay their hands. Now, the thing the right has really benefited from the last few years, other than the, the disaster of Joe Biden's economy, and the reason Joe Biden's economy is a disaster is the Democrats overplayed their hands on that. They got all this money uh, and, and it spent from Washington and thought it would help them, and they overplayed their hand on it. And it's crashed the economy and caused inflation. And then the, their righteousness and their defund the police and all their craziness out there, the right has benefited from the insanity of the left. The left will benefit from us if we go insane. And so I would just, I, I incur, and I know it drives everybody crazy when I say it. But I would just caution us to be humble and operate with some level of humility so that we do not infuriate the voters. There is no such thing as permanence in politics, but you can certainly soften the landing instead of having a cold rejection from the voters. The Democrats have done nothing to soften the landing that's coming in November. They are going to be cruelly and coldly rejected by the by the voters. Turn out of office. Uh, part of me, I have this growing nagging suspicion that if it is that bad, as, I, as bad as I think it's going to be, Joe Biden, instead of trotting out uh, Mayorkas and throwing him to the wolves, is going to come out and say, oh, over to you, Kamala, I quit. I, I don't, it's not, gut, the odds of it happening are pretty slim. But if it's as brutal as I expect it to be, I mean, he may just say, uh, to hell with this and, and go on back to Delaware. And, and he can be a, a two-year president. I don't know. It's going to be brutal for them unless we on our side go nuts and overplay our hand on, on these issues. And we don't even know, by the way, what the Dobbs decision is going to be. We don't. Uh, there were it, it, Tom Goldstein from SCOTUS blog has a theory that there were actually two leaks, one from the right, one from the left. The one from the right was to the Wall Street Journal without anything other than eh, they're still squabbling and, and Barrett, Kavanaugh are wobbly, which is what the Wall Street Journal editorial page reported. And then here comes the actual printed thing from a left wing reporter, which was probably a left wing um job done to try to provoke and freeze Kavanaugh and, and Barrett from going to the right by showing them how angry people would be. But I think that's just, I mean, if it's my personality, if something like this happens and it it, it makes people mad, I'm digging in my heels and saying, nope, I'm doing this. Uh, screw you people. This is punishment for you people acting like a nut. Uh, that's what I would do. And and But they ought to go on and release the opinion now. We're still going to, man, this is still going to be the Sunday shows. They're all lined up to talk about this issue. You cannot get away from it this weekend. And then, of course, by Monday, we'll have all the reports of all of the churches that were vandalized over the weekend by progressive activists. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. We're going to burn your church down. Yeah, that's going to go over real well with the public. Patriot Mobile, speaking of this pro-life fight, has been contributing money to the pro-life cause. So the profits of the company 
go to the pro-life movement. Not all, but some. And some of the prophets go to the Second Amendment movement. Some go to veterans and first responders. It's such a good company, and they're Christian conservatives explicitly so. They need you as a customer in order to expand their business. And by expanding their business, they grow their profits. By growing their profits, they help the movement. And right now, you get free activation with my name. And don't worry about service because they use the same cell towers everybody else uses. You get 5G data voice, great quality. You go to patriotmobile.com slash Eric, patriotmobile.com slash E-R-I-C-K, or you can call them. They have 100% U.S.-based customer service. It's 972-PATRIOT. Tell them I sent you. Not only do you get free activation with my name, they give great discounts to you. If you're a teacher, veteran, first responder, a gun owner, so many discounts. And if you've got a large family and multiple lines, Patriot Mobile can probably save you some good money, too, because they give discounts for that. Patriotmobile.com slash Eric. Hi there. It is Eric Erickson. The phone number is, well, you know what? Who cares about it? Because there isn't enough time. Okay. This is actually pretty funny. Uh, Not the B. Not the B is the Babylon B straight news website. And they are relating to a Politico story. The Politico has a story covering uh, the reason Joe Biden so often appears at a fake Oval Office. When you see Joe Biden giving speeches these days, more likely than not, you're gonna see him look like he's in the Oval Office, but he's not in the Oval Office. He's actually on a stage in the Eisenhower Executive Office Building, um, which is the, the old, the beautiful, beautiful building right next to the White House, uh, built in the, the French, what, Third Empire style or Empire style, whatever it is. Um, gorgeous building, by the way. I've been inside it many, many times. And Joe Biden goes in there. Why? Well, I should just read you from the story because it's it's too good. A bone he broke in his foot while playing with his dog in late November 2020 still occasionally bothers Biden, resulting in a slower and shorter gait. And the White House has largely abandoned using the Oval Office for press events in part because it can't be permanently equipped with a teleprompter. Biden aides prefer the fake White House stage built in the old executive office building next door for events, sacrificing some of the power of the historic backdrop in favor of an otherwise sterile room that was outfitted with an easily read teleprompter screen. He's got to stay. They've got to keep him on script. I mean, the dude could start World War III with with one of his stupid jokes or or one of his flubs. He was telling someone today, he was caught on film telling somebody he'd been in and out of Afghanistan, Iran, and Iraq more than 50 times. No, he hasn't. In his entire 50-year career in Washington, he has not been to the Middle East 50 times. He has not. It's documented. Uh, And yet that's what he was telling someone. The, The man is a fabulist. They have to keep him on script. It's not just because he's old and senile. It's because he's a fabulist. He just makes stuff up. So they got to write it for him and keep him on script. It's just, and and of course, the media doesn't fact check him. This is a a wish casting story from the Politico about how a Biden-Trump rematch is is coming. I don't know that it is. I don't think he's going to run again. He's too old.